So tonight's talk is going to be based on um, Saint Ephraim and his ideas, his concepts of the self-revelation of God. Um, before we start, does anyone know anything about Saint Ephraim? Any ideas or just, just anything about Saint Ephraim in general? Okay. That he was a deacon.
is limited comes to know that which is unlimited. Unless God himself reveals everything of him to us. So throughout Ephraim's works, this is the main idea that's permeated. The main idea that's permeated that all knowledge, all understanding, coming to know God, is a freely given initiative by God himself. So God, you know, the limitless, the boundless God, the God who is infinitely far from humanity, has become infinitely close and united to humanity. And it's through this condescending um, initiative, condescending, I don't mean in a negative way, but condescending means in this humbling initiative. So God humbled himself in order for man to come to know God. So this basically goes on what I've been speaking of for the past few weeks of the Syriac idea of deification. So God came down to our level, so man can go up to God's level. So God came down to us so we can be united to him, come to know him, and live eternity as he intended from the beginning of creation, live eternity with him. Um, just a brief, you know, we always have to understand when talking about church fathers, we have to have a small look at their life, sort of a historical approach first, to understand things that influenced him and why the, the um, church fathers went down, went down the path the same way. So, the church regards Ephraim in the, in the Syriac sense, in the Eastern sense, as the greatest author and composer of literature in the Syriac language. So there's no one greater than him when it comes to composing hymns or theological literature in the Syriac language. Uh, little is known about his life, so not much is known about Ephraim, except that he died in 373 AD, so early on in the church, and roughly in June, early June, roughly 9th of June. Um, he wasn't a traveler, he was an ascetic, not really a monk because monasticism had emerged then. So he was what we call Yehidoyo. So he was one with the one. So he, he, the Syriac ascetic tradition of living oneness, living the secluded life with God who is one. So Jesus who is alone, he lived his life alone with him. Um, he lived in this space, in space for all his, all, for the, ten, the final ten years of his life. And he was both a deacon and a theological teacher. And he served under a number of different bishops. So the bishops of the, of the area, so Jacob, Babu, and Abraham. So during that time, if we know history, there was something called the Roman Persian War, and um, Ephraim suffered quite a fair bit during this war because until the towns he lived in were destroyed. So there were three major sieges, 338, 346, and 350 AD, roughly you know, not much time between them, and the towns he lived in during these times were destroyed. And as part of the stipulation, so you know, the towns lost, this space was, um, was transferred to the Persian Empire, so it was no longer under Christian control, and all Christians were expelled from the city. So that meant, you know, towards the end of his life, so Ephraim had to go and settle in Edessa. And it's during this time in Edessa where we see the majority of his texts were written. So the majority of his theological works, the majority of his hymns, the majority of uh, basically his spiritual works were written in this period. So. Like I said, we have to understand these church fathers. So it's obviously this, this pain and suffering that he felt for having his home, spent home hometown destroyed, his family killed, his, his loved ones killed, and being expelled from this place where he grew up and lived all his life. This, this forced sort of an internal change, and this spiritual change in Ephraim, which allowed him to delve deeply into these spiritual concepts and produce the majority, or the vast majority of his work in the final 10 years he spent in Edessa. Um, Ephraim talks about now going going into the works of Ephraim. I can't go through all the hymns because the hymns aren't just small part like you know hymns we have today. But his hymns, for example, the hymns on paradise. I might use a few examples from that of volumes. So there are books and books called the hymns on paradise. Or the so I can't go through all of them. I'll use concepts, main concepts that 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 are used throughout his works. We'll discuss those today. So one of the main and basic concepts he utilizes is called the garment of words. So the clothes of words, the garment of words. Now, there's a massive gap that emerges when, in a, philosoph in a philosophical sense, there's a massive gap that emerges when we, do, when we try, when man tries to understand something beyond man. So as, as Ephraim would say, or in, in terms that Ephraim would, use, Ephraim would use, when man comes to understand God, there's something lacking. So God, the infinite, cannot be grasped by creation because creation is finite in nature. So the nature of, of creation is limited, whereas God, his nature is limitless. 
So in the hierarchy of things, hierarchy of knowledge, that which comes below cannot understand that which comes above. So God the Creator cannot be grasped by man who is created. That's important to understand because that's the basis for all of this, um, you know, the idea or concept of self-revelation of God. So it's apparent, it's, it's, it's apparent throughout, you know, the, the works of Ephraim that in order for man to experience or come to know God, the initiative has to be freely given by God. It can't come from man, but it has to come from the divine. So the boundless creator has to have the initiative to allow man to come closer to him. So God has to allow man to come closer to him. There has to be some sort of you know, bridging of this gap between man and God. And where do we see this? We see this in this, in this humbling act where God became incarnate. God took flesh. And what is flesh? Flesh is, is man. God took flesh. God became man in order for man to come to know God. So in a way, if we take it now in a poetic way and or linguistic way, God has chosen to put on names. God has chosen to put on flesh. God has chosen to put on words to allow man to know him. And knowledge doesn't, knowledge doesn't only mean um, you know, a mental sort of understanding or grasping, but knowledge means a transmission, a communication of these ideas. So God became flesh for man to be able to describe this flesh for man to be able to communicate the ideas associated with his flesh. So God put on these clothes of words, this garment of words, in order for man to communicate his ideas and come to know man, and come to know God, and to teach other men, and teach others about God that became flesh. So God has freely chosen to put on names and take the garment of words, allowing man to come to know him. So if you want to take a more technical approach, God has humbled himself, God has condescended to the level of man to reveal himself through the human language and thought. Through, so now through the human language and thought, we can actually come to describe aspects of God and characteristics of God. So Ephraim utilizes um, imagery or vivid imagery to illustrate this interaction between God and man. So God's condescent, condescension or coming down and subsequent incarnation. So God's coming down into Mary, being conceived by Mary. And his incarnation, are poetically described by Ephraim as God undressing his glory, to God removing his garments of glory, and clothing himself with the garments of flesh, dressed in a body. So God undressed his glory, clothed himself in flesh, and redressed himself in the, in the garment of words. So it's an act of humility by God in order to elevate man to a level of coming to know him, elevate man to a level of understanding him. Now, I'll read a small part of the hymn on nativity, um, 23, chapter 23, part 13, the hymns on nativity, which explains this in Ephraim's words. So all these changes did the most for one make, stripping off glory and putting on a body. For he had devised a way to reclothe Adam in that glory which Adam has stripped off. So in a sense, now we start seeing this concept that through God's humility, he started to return man, Adam, man, to a level where God intended man to be initially. So God now is allowing man to come to know this divine glory. God is allowing man to know this, this glorified you know, truth in order for man to slowly start approaching God, to come to know God, for this process of deification, this process of unity with God to become apparent. So both of these acts, the acts of condescension, so the act of God in his humility coming down to the level of man, clothing himself in flesh, in words, both infinite acts of love. So God is giving himself in completion to humanity so that man can come to be united with him and participate with God, which is basically the fulfillment of the plan of salvation. So, in essence, uh, these true acts of humility, so the acts of God coming down and taking flesh, are essential and important and cannot be removed from basically Christian thought and the idea of Christ himself, because without them, there is no knowledge of God, and without them, there is uh, no relationship with God. So if, if I read again from, from his works, this time on the hymn on faith, we should realize that had he not put on names of such things, it would have not been possible for him to speak with us humans. But by means of what belongs to us, did it draw up close to us, 
He clothed himself in language so that he might clothe us in his, in his mode of life. He asked for our form and put this on. And then as a father with his children, he spoke with our childish state. So Ephraim here is sort of restating this idea that in, in the hierarchy of creation, in the hierarchy of being and knowledge, we're below God. Yet yeah, God, like a father, you know, took on a level like, like a father does with a child. He takes on this, this level of the child in a language the child understands, disciplines the child, speaks to the child, teaches the child. In the same way, God took on this state that we're in, in compared to him as children, below him, you know, infinitely below the limitless bounds of God, in order to communicate to us and come to know us, to teach us and to elevate us to the level of, of deification and divinity. So God wore flesh, he took on names, so he took on words, he took on this, this, this body which can be described, so that God can, um, so, sorry that, so that coming to know God, man may, may sanctify himself. So this is, in essence, this is once again, the process of deification. Man is raised to the level of participation with the divine by coming to know him, you know, by wearing names, by putting on names, uh, well, well the, the, the garment of words, we start to see biblical imagery and metaphorical explanations that point man in the direction of understanding God. So it's only through the fact that God humbled himself that we can start to understand scripture itself. Because if God hadn't taken flesh, then, you know, scripture would be extremely limited in explaining God to man. You know, the, the prophecies, the Song of Songs, the Psalms, you know, the entire Old Testament would be irrelevant if God hadn't taken flesh himself, if God hadn't revealed himself to man, if God hadn't come down to man, then everything in Scripture would be irrelevant because they would just be words, but words that don't really fit this image of God, words that don't really explain anything, words that don't lead man to anywhere, because there will be this gap, you know, there will be this, this gap in creation where God himself hadn't filled by becoming, uh, by becoming flesh and man. So... In order for man to interact now, <clears throat> it's a freely given initiative by God. You know, man can't force God to become incarnate. It was a freely given initiative by God. And, and Ephraim uses four, four different ideas in order to explain the way man can interact with his loving, in, uh, loving uh, humbling act by God. So these ideas, I'll say them first in Syriac, because you know, the language Ephraim used was obviously Syriac, and then I'll explain them in English. So, first freely interact with this with this freely given initiative by God, there has to be um, something called Fushono. So Fushono is discernment. So we have to discern these ideas revealed to us by God. Then there has to be Dahlo. Dahlo is fear. So in fearing discernment, in a fearful discernment, we come to acknowledge God, that God is beyond us, beyond all comprehension. Then there is Dahlo, which is wonder. So, in fearful discernment, we come to acknowledge God in all His awe and might. We come to enter into this wondrous glory that is God. And the final thing, the final aspect, the final level of, of coming to interact with this freely given initiative is horrible, which is love. So, in fearful discernment, we come to acknowledge this glorious nature of God, this glorious aspect, this glorious characteristics, this glorious being in front of us as humbled Himself. We enter into this wondrous relationship, which finally leads to a true relationship of love. So, for shono discernment, dehlo or fear, dehlo wonder, and shono love are the four levels or the four stages of interaction man takes with God and coming to know Him, based on this this um, humbling initiative He took to come flesh. So, any now, now whenever we read anything in the scripture, whenever we read any prayers, whenever we, we hear any hymns, whenever we hear anything of God or come to know of new characteristics based on God, this is the process which, which we should begin to go through. You know, in discern, when we start to think about these ideas, in fear, by fear, I don't mean fear or I'm scared, but fear basically of knowing our nothingness compared to these characteristics, compared to God, compared to God himself, compared to these ideas being revealed by God. And then we enter into wonder, into all, that this divine being became flesh is revealing these characteristics to me, is revealing these things of God, of paradise, of life eternal to me. And finally, by understanding all these, we enter into the true relationship with God, into true participation.
which is one of, of pure love and true love. So these qualities, these emotions, are necessary for man to come to know God because then these are the emotions that move the spirit. You know, these are emotions that we experience. And like I initially said, something that is beyond, something that is spiritual cannot be experienced through the intellect purely, but also experienced in a spiritual sense. So these four steps enter us into a spiritual experience with God, coming to know Him, coming to understand basically His conversation, coming to understand His is um, initiative of, of uh, becoming incarnate, coming to understand the dumb of words that he put on. Because without putting on the dumb of words, man cannot enter into the relationship with God. And only through, only through entering into the relationship with God can we come to understand these you know, emotionally and spiritually. So there is no linguistic expression, so language. There is no linguistic expression or phrase that can truly comprehend, that truly understands or truly sort of explains these ideas because they're all emotional ideas, they're all spiritual ideas. Yeah? There's nothing in language today, there's nothing in words today that could limit or that, that could explain the overabundant revelation of God. Since God's revelation, like I said, is a spiritual and emotional one. Now, if you look at the hymns of paradise, Ephraim begins with this idea, explains this idea of the overwhelming nature of revelation based on paradise itself. So he says, Scripture brought me to the gate of paradise, and the mind which is spiritual stood in amazement and wonder as it entered. The intellect grew dizzy and weak, as the senses were no longer able to contain its treasures. So magnificent they were, also to discern its savours and find any comparison for its colours, or take in its beauties so as to describe them in words. So, standing in front of this idea of paradise, Ephraim takes us through these four levels. So, standing, so, uh, discernment, yep, yeah? and the mind which is spiritual stood in amazement and wonder as it entered. So, there's at this point we have discernment and we have wonder. The intellect grew dizzy and weak, fear, and the senses were no longer able to contain its treasures. So, we have all these aspects of these stages, you know, that Ephraim's taken us through to come to know God. And in his words, in his garment of words that Ephraim is using to describe God, he's instilling this emotional experience, not just an intellectual experience. Because the intellect, like I said, is beyond, is, is, is limited to God, who is beyond all intellect. And so, we have to enter now into the spiritual aspects and the emotional aspects to come to know God. So it's only through the created imagery Ephraim uses and that emerges in his works that the garment of words or spiritual truths are uh, fully portrayed. Uh, so by saying this, by understanding this, and you know, going back to scripture, uh, the intellect can only grow through meditation and discernment in the treasure house of hidden things. So the treasure house of hidden things, as Ephraim says, of Gazot Kasyoto. Gazot Kasyoto is the treasure house of hidden things, and in this sense he relates to scripture. So by only meditating and discerning scripture, can man come to know the fullness of God. But at the same time, understanding and meditating upon scripture can't be taken, an understanding, sorry, an understanding or meditation upon scripture can't be taken by any person who comes in with you know, um, any random attitude to do this. Ephraim speaks about um, each person is given compared to his, uh, is associated to his intention, associated to his level. So if, is, if a person enters into this process of coming to know God, it takes it as a joke. He's not going to be illumined. You know, his eyes aren't going to be illumined by this divine light the same way as a person who, in fear, in wonder, in awe, in amazement, in love, enters into this relationship with God because this person would enter into full illumination whereas the other person who takes these things in sort of a light heart would enter into a partial illumination and the full hiddenness of God won't be made apparent to him. So basically the amount that God reveals to each person is proportional to their spiritual um, stature, the spiritual level, the spiritual development they have. Those that are poor in spirit in this case, poor in spirit, I'm not talking about the Beatitudes. Poor in spirit, I'm talking about poor in their spiritual life. Receive close to nothing. You know, receive close to nothing but glimpses. You know? They won't have this full image of Christ, full image of God, but they'd have different images, different glimpses, 
in front of this immense glory, in front of this immense being, this divinity which is in front of you. So Moses wasn't afraid, you know, you screaming or scared or no, no, no. It was a fear of knowing your nothingness. Like you're not worthy to, to come to know this. You're not worthy to stand here. You're not worthy to interact with this divinity. So if we read that, if you if you go back and read that, uh, you know that that event in Moses' life, that's that's the fear that the Syriac fathers are talking about. One of knowing your basically worthlessness, you know, your limitedness, your finitude, your your bound in front of its infiniteness, this limitless being, this boundless being, basically, you're created, is a creator. It's coming to know this, that there is a gap there, which you can't bridge. That's all, that's all the fear is. It's not an actual fear of, of being scared, but it's just the fear of coming to know your true nature and your true essence and the true circumstances in which man currently lives in or is living in. And that makes so much sense as to why fear comes before wonder, because it's, it's yeah. in recognizing that that you're able to acknowledge him in all his might. Yeah. Okay, got it. Well, I just wanted to know what's the good evening out. Just wanted to know to do with the to do with defining things. Um, does it also apply because I'm part of using of groups um, churches as well, and I find it hard to be able to grab answers. So is it like in um, like Eastern Orthodox as well as Eastern Catholic rites prefer to keep things mystical, whereas the West, Latin, or the Roman Church likes to define things um, like philosophically and use like Saint Augustine's some uh, all of that stuff. Uh, so in the Eastern Church, all Eastern churches, be they the Orthodox, Byzantine, Syriac, um, the Armenians, or Coptics, the Eastern churches. They're based on different schools of thought. You know, we have the school of Antioch, we have the school of Constantinople, we have the school of Alexandria, and then you have the, the Oriental, you know, the five, the Assyrians, and their different schools of thought, and then the St. Thomas churches in India, and their schools of thought. They all, they all come from the same root of, of mysticism, because mysticism was part of Eastern Semitic um, culture. You know, so all Christian schools of thought emerge from the culture they're in. Yeah. Whereas in the West, you had the, the overarching school of thought was a Greco-Roman philosophical or a Hellenistic philosoph uh, philosophical school of thought. You know, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. I'm not saying they didn't influence Eastern Eastern schools of thought. No, they did influence them. But the influence moved towards a mystical sort of experience as opposed to a linguistic or, or literary or intellectual experience. And yeah, because that's why I was like wondering as to why, um, like, when you're talking about defining things and why did, um, you know, this conversation can go on for a long time, but anyway, yeah. someone else wants to step in. Um, so any other questions about the garment of, of words or these concepts? Alright, so we'll move on then, move on. So now we come to a point where we can start talking about hiddenness and revelation. So hiddenness, so things that are unknown, and revelation, things that are revealed. So through the use of types and symbols, so types once again are different images that relate to um, God in this case, or paradise, or eternity, or Christ, and symbols which were, you know, for the past a uh, couple weeks, we've been talking about symbolism. So through the use of types and symbols, the divine has adopted so the divine being God adopts, takes on um, human means in order to convey or communicate this spiritual meaning. So like I, like I explained right now in one of these past questions, you know, God took flesh in order to explain these spiritual ideas, spiritual concepts, you know, in a way that flesh understands it, so in a way that human understands it. So the types and symbols, they're nothing but indicators. They're nothing but, you know, pointers that direct us towards these hidden truths. And that, that direct us to the truths um, beyond the flesh. You know, we can talk about Christ made man, you know, Christ made flesh, Christ incarnate as much as we want. But if everything we talk about is based on the flesh, then there's an issue. Because all these symbolisms, all these ideas, all these concepts that we talk about associated with Christ have to have to push us, you know, beyond the flesh. Has to push us, you know, um, beyond beyond nature, beyond man. Because Christ made flesh is the bridge that leads to divinity. So Christ made flesh is a bridge that allows us to come to understand 
this limitless nature or come to begin to grasp ideas of the limitless nature that is God uh, and his boundless love and boundless being. So through tangible types, so through physical types and symbols, the spiritual and transcendent ideas um, are communicated and become apparent. So without these, you know, without this physical means of communication, you know, without the flesh, uh, all spiritual ideas, all divine ideas, you know, all concepts of the faith are abstract, you know, abstract, something that, you know, we can sit and contemplate and meditate upon, yet we can never grasp, we can never understand, we can never interact with them. So when talking about typology, because, you know, most of the Syriac fathers use typology, when talking about typology, uh, a paradox emerges. So the paradox that emerges is between the revelation and the hiddenness of God, you know, at, at the same time, as much as God is revealed, he remains hidden. At the same time, as much as God remains hidden, he can only be ever revealed to man. So there's this paradox, this link, this paradox in relationship between these two terms associated with God. So what God reveals to humans, you know, what God reveals to man through types and symbols is absolutely genuine. But due to human freedom, so due to our limited understanding, our limited nature, you know, due to man being bound in flesh, created, our understanding can never be genuine. By genuine, I mean absolute. So whenever God reveals to us, is an absolute revelation, yet because man is limited, his understanding is an absolute. So, does anyone, know, does anyone need you know, further explanation of that? Because that is a massive concept. You know, is that going to last forever, or does that change when we get into heaven? Because... So, no, see, when, well, once we enter into heaven, we've entered into the beatific, uh, the beatific vision. So we come to know the fullness of God. You know, I'm, I'm talking about man, the flesh, not man, the spiritual being. Not man, you know, not man um, in the glory of God or man in the fulfillment of eschatology. I'm talking about man, the flesh. So everything we know about God right now, I'll repeat it again. So God, being God, being perfect, reveals everything associated with himself in perfection, in completion, as God. Yet yeah, man being limited, man being limited, being bound, being of the flesh, being of nature, can only ever understand it in a finitude manner. So we can never understand the fullness of God's create of God's revelation, even though God reveals to us in fullness himself. Because it comes down to human intellect being unable to comprehend, you know, the boundless revelation that is God made flesh. So we understand God in a limited way, in a limited way. So Isaiah 55 9 says that, no? Sorry? Isaiah, I think Isaiah 55 9 says that as far as the heavens are above the earth, so far my way is above your ways. Yes. Above your tongues. Yes, yes. So in order to explain this, Ephraim uses two, two concepts. So the subjective and the objective perspective of revelation. So We'll, we'll talk about beginning with the subjective perspective because it relates to man directly. So through the subjective uh, um, subjective perspective of, of, of hiddenness and revelation, so through understanding the hiddenness revelation, man's experience in coming to know God or the transcendent is emphasized. You know, this experience of coming to know God is emphasized and made apparent, but at the same time, our limitations to understand it is also emphasized and made apparent. And that's because man, in essence, is inadequate to understand the Creator. Yeah. The capacity of man's mind is inadequate to come to know God, to come to understand God in His completion. We see, we see God in front of us, yet we have no language, we have no emotions, we have no experiences. There is no capacity for us to fully describe God. What we can do is describe these experiences and describe God and describe this, this revelation of God in order to get to the hiddenness based on the garment of words he's clothed himself in. But as I said, the garment of words being human, being flesh, for us is limited. God clothed himself in unlimited revelation. Yet for us to, to communicate this revelation, for us to understand this communication, it's limited because our minds, our, our capacity, our understanding of concepts is limited. And like I said previously, in a revelation where each person is illumined compared to their capacity, their spiritual capacity and development. 
So this, the, the perfected spiritual development, you know, the perfection of spiritual life can only happen in eschatology, can only happen in, you know, life to come. That's where true union, complete union happens. That's where, where the true truth and revelation of the hiddenness of God can, can occur, you know, in a boundless and limitless way. Now, as far as man is bound by flesh, we can only describe God associated with the flesh that we saw. So that's here, this becomes a subjective perspective, you know, subjective to each man. So each man associated with his experiences, each man associated with his understanding of these concepts, each man associated with his relationship with God, you know, going through those four levels of, of this emotional and spiritual um, uh, relationships with God, or emotional and spiritual experiences with God, you know, each man compared to these puts forward a subjective perspective of what is revealed to him. Right? So this is why the idea of church is important and the idea of community is important and the idea of having you know, a church hierarchy that goes through this explanation is important because each of us has its own characteristic that they experience of Christ or idea of Christ that they experience. That coming all together as one community, coming all together as one church, all, the, all these ideas put together start to produce to us a full image of Christ, a full image of God. Never complete, but fuller than each individual subjective ID. So this is why our community is important and the church itself is important. Um, so we can't, uh, we can't forget in this sense, in the subjective sense, that all types, so all symbolism, all revelations of the hiddenness of God, will only depict partial manifestations, so partial explanations, partial realizations of the truth and of the true glory that is God. Because like I said, it, it, it depends on the comprehension of man and man's mental capacity is eternally limited compared to what God reveals to us. So this is only brought into completion and fullness in eschaton, so in the time of eschatology or the times to come. And until the end times, until all time is fulfilled, uh, human knowledge of the divine can only ever be limited due to the limited nature of man. So this is a subjective view. So we can always describe God in, in as many words, concepts, ideas, symbols, images, you know, descriptions, poems, hymns, or legalistic approach. We can describe God in many different ways. Yet all these ways are always lacking because man's capacity, the mental capacity of man, his human nature lacks in front of the boundless nature of God. And now we come to the second perspective that, that Ephraim talks about, or Ephraim utilizes in his works, which is the objective perspective. So we've just spoken about the subjective perspective, and now the objective perspective of hiddenness and revelation. So unlike the subjective perspective, the objective perspective begins with the existence of truth. So at this time, we don't begin with man's, man's attempts to understand. We begin with this boundless truth. So this time, we begin from above, not from below. So the subjective perspective begins from man coming to understand God, while the objective perspective begins with the truth, the complete truth, revealing itself. So the point of initiation is not the human experience of God in the objective perspective, but God's ability to reveal himself God existing objectively and simultaneously experienced by man in human ways. So it's now we enter this is purely mystical. This is this is beyond basically physical understanding. So God exists objectively, you know, he's a creator. There's no need for anyone to create God, or there is no need for anyone or anything to exist for God to exist. He exists because he exists. You know, I am who I am, as God told Moses. There's no other way to explain him. I am who I am, I exist. And because God exists, he is objective. So he's not, he, he doesn't rely on any notion, any concept, or any, anyone else to acknowledge him. He exists. But at the same time, God's existence is one that can only ever be experienced by man in hidden ways. So God exists, and because God allowed for a relationship to occur between man and the divine, there can always be experiences that in hidden ways never fully revealed. So like I said, the full revelation happens in eschaton, or eschaton, the fulfillment of time. So as an example of this, you know, we, we go back to the divine liturgy, we go back to the liturgical practices. As an example of this, you know, we receive the body and blood of Christ as bread and wine, and the elements of, of bread and wine. So 
the body and blood of Christ is hidden to all, yet we, we consume this truth, you know, in the type of bread and wine. So we experience, even though the hiddenness, you know, even though Christ truly exists, blood and, uh, blood and, uh, blood and flesh, Christ truly exists. Man's limited ability, and he objectively as he exists, we don't need to acknowledge he exists, but he exists as it is in blood, in flesh, he exists truly. But because of our limited you know, understanding, our limited uh, accepting, our limited ability to understand his divine nature, he exists in the form, in the type of bread and wine. So like I said, he is objective, yet we experience him associated with our limited understanding of things. So in the second coming, this is now the time of eschatology, in the second coming, Christ would come truly flesh and blood as man. Christ would come in his full glory. So in the fullness of time, Christ will be, will be revealed to us in his fullest glory, in the fullness of his glory, as opposed to right now, Christ in his fullness, you know, in the fullness of his glory, is present in blood and flesh, flesh and blood. Yet man's inability to understand his concepts, to comprehend his concepts, means we see it as bread and wine, as the types of bread and wine. So in both cases of Christ's second coming and our experience, our physical experience of Christ during the Mass, uh, the divine is revealed objectively to man, yet is subjectively experienced by man. Yeah, we understand that concept, right? So, and this is an example in the divine liturgy. Yeah, the, you know, in the in, in the liturgy, so in the mass, the divine, which is God, which is Christ, is revealed objectively to us. His body and blood, you know, the flesh and blood, is revealed to us, yet is conceived or is perceived and understood and acknowledged in a subjective way in the type of bread and wine. Because that's man's understanding. We cannot understand, we cannot go beyond the physical because we're limited. We're limited, we cannot go beyond the physical. We cannot go, what we see in front of us is bread and wine. Yet we acknowledge that to be in the blood and body of Christ. So that's the idea now that God himself is objective, yet man's understanding is subjective. I can see you struggling. So, brother, can I just clarify? Yeah. Subjective perspective mm-hmm. is man getting to know God yes. through, his, through his revelations, mm-hmm. but this is limited because of our nature, not because of yes. God. So, therefore, the objective perspective is that it begins with God, that God just exists. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously him revealing himself again we're limited in understanding that and then he just like that so your example was in liturgy god is revealed objectively through his flesh and blood that's the truth yeah. of the matter yes but subjectively we perceive that as bread and wine because we're limited yeah. but we yes. can come to know that as the body and blood of christ yes we come to know that yeah, yeah. and okay. that's and the fullness yeah. and the fullness of that yeah. And we come to know the fullness of that in the second coming. Okay, all right. Where we enter yeah. into this spiritual, so we, we go beyond, in the second coming, beyond the physical, or beyond, you know, the world, beyond the world as we know it today, you know, the physical aspects of the world and nature. We enter into this eternal spiritual relationship. Yeah. We enter into the glory of God. So in the second coming, we come to see the trueness, you know, of the presence of Christ, of the presence of God, because we experience it. So we would not have a subjective perspective because it would only be objective. Because we objective. will be with truth itself, basically. Yes, because we, because ultimately, like I said, the, the idea here is deification. You know, yeah. and these processes that Ephraim speaks about, the Syriac Church speaks about, is the steps towards deification where we're united, finally and eternally to God. So we become basically partakers in the divine. We become partakers in this basically in the sea of knowledge and sea of love and sea of understanding and sea of fatherhood and sea basically everything. We become partakers in this immensity that is God. Much better. Thank you. Okay. Anna Dole? Um, Baba, I just wanted to clarify something really quickly. Yeah. So when you, when you said how, wait, so did you say basically the idea of God's existence that we can have knowledge on it, 
that it cannot be comprehended. Because we can have knowledge that existed because it, it's self-evident, but it just cannot be comprehended. So, the fullness of the knowledge of God cannot be comprehended. You know, God reveals to us um, different characteristics. He, like I said, the garment of words he wore allows us to talk about different characteristics of him, allows us to communicate ideas of him, but the fullness of Christ, the fullness of God, the fullness of divinity can never be comprehended. Unless, uh, until we get to the point of, of true union with God, of the pro of this point of deification, which the Syriac fathers speak about. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alright, so... Now, just... Just a recap, a small recap, because I'm you know, running out of time. Just a small recap, so... Through poetic imagery... Uh, going, going through now the poetic imagery used by, by Ephraim. So through his poetic imagery, different concepts of, of typology and divine revelation become approachable. They become experienced emotionally as opposed to dogmatic or just linguistic or intellectual explanations. So through these techniques that Ephraim uses, um, the self-revelation of God or his condescension, his humbling act of becoming incarnate, is made known. So man, be uh, God becomes man for man to know God. God takes on flesh for man to take on divinity. So this allows for a deeper, yet even though it's a deeper understanding of God, a deeper relationship with God, um, it's always a partial relationship with God because even though we have this ability to know God because he's flesh, our knowledge is always subjective, bound by basically the limited capacity of man's mind and bound by the limited capacity of nature itself. So it's only in eschaton, it's only in eschatology, it's only in the time to come, in the fulfillment of all time and plan of salvation, that the true objective knowledge, the true objective understanding of God as the pure truth, as the truth that exists, is known, because at that point we would have reached, or hopefully strive to reach, the deification or true union the Syriac Fathers speak about when we partake in the divine and where we can experience this truth as God intends it, from the beginning of time to the end of time. Um, so I'll stop right about now, about you know, the self-revelation of God, and I'll leave some time because I'm going to be over the hour mark. I'll leave some time now for discussion because there are a lot of concepts that I spoke about. You know, and like I said, Ephraim, you know, Ephraim, his works are the school of theology in and of itself, in and of themselves. And there's no way anyone can address all the concepts and ideas about the revelation of God in his works or the concepts he uses. But I hope this, I hope this could be seen as a small introduction, you know, something that inspires you to go, you know, go on your own and then look these ideas up, look these concepts up, because, you know, other than that, it's impossible for anyone to see and write about these ideas and concepts or explain them all, especially within, you know, the limit of time we have in these meetings. So if anyone has any um, ideas, any clarification, or topics to discuss, or just questions, we're more than likely now to sort of all discuss. Raquel? Hey brother, just me again. Um, just a question. I know you um, explained it earlier to um, someone else, and he explained it very well as well, but the concept of emotion yep. is not that it's not the emotion, like, you know, when you say women emotion, like, no, no, no. as an example. It's not that emotion. Can you explain it um, again in terms of what emotion we are referring to when you say through the emotion? Is it, like, through the senses? Like, like, no, see? Yeah. If you can explain that, please. All right, like I said, you know, God is beyond the intellect. God is beyond the physical. God is beyond words. What we have with words and the intellect... Uh, partial sort of explanations of what God is. Now, throughout Ephraim's works, his works on poetry and his hymns, um, Ephraim, you know, utilizes this uh, this technique of allowing you to experience these, these spiritual ideas and concepts. Because only through experience, you know, can you truly understand the concept. Can you truly grasp the concept? Because if you read something, fair enough, you read it. You might not memorize it. But if you experience something. That experience stays with you longer, you know. So Ephraim, throughout his works, 
utilizes symbolism and imagery in order to play on emotions. But, so throughout his hymns, you can see this throughout the hymns we use as well, because our, our hymns, you know, it's a roller coaster of emotions, a roller coaster of, of ideas and things, of, of internal experiences. So the four, go back to the four levels, you know, the first thing when, we, when we're reading the hymns, you know, Ephraim enters us into this, this state of discernment. We think about what it looks, what's being rubbed, like, what is this? And then the fear, like I said, the fear that Moses had in front of the burning bush, that, oh, I actually can't understand this, this is beyond my limit, this is amazing. Then we enter into wonder and awe, like, this is amazing, this is God, this is divinity. And then through entering into wonder and awe, we experience the emotion of love. So basically we experience God himself, because God is love. So it's not emotions as anger or hate or, or lust or, or all these different emotions. No, no, no. It's the internal experience, the internal experience of coming to know God. That's what this emotional game that Ephraim plays is. It's this internal experience of coming to know God. Thank you so much. That was perfect. Yeah. Um, any other concepts that need clarification? clarification again on how God reveals himself to us. And it's, I don't know if this might be like a dumb question, but in, in instances where uh, Christ reveals himself to saints in apparitions, for example, like um, Saint Christina, yeah. do saints experience at, at least a partial revelation of who God is? So, I'm going to give you an honest response. I absolutely have no idea. And if you know anyone who's actually received one of these apparitions, let me know because we can ask him together. And that's that's an honest response. I have no idea. Okay. Okay. There are some questions in the in the comments. Um, we have already experienced this revelation through Christ, haven't we? Like we talked about through His incarnation. Yeah. So, like I said, God is a God is objective truth and perfection. So, any revelation God has given us, even through His incarnation, you know, it's a complete and perfect, perfect revelation. But due to our subjective understanding, due to our human nature, we can only understand it partially. But God does everything, you know, in in, in perfection and completion. So, all revelations of God are complete and perfect and perfected. But it's just the man's inability to come to this profession that means we have this limited understanding of, of God himself. Um, Alright, any other questions? Alright, well if there are any, if there are any other questions, um, well, thanks all for, for joining. Hopefully you know, it's been a learning experience and hopefully, you know, you, you go go now and you know, do a bit more research on your own because, you know, Ephraim is quite amazing and there's no way anyone can cover all topics of Ephraim and all ideas that he's spoken about just in an hour or a couple of hours and um, everyone stay safe and most likely see you all next Sunday as well.